Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So, good afternoon to everyone who's gathered together for this um, third of the Sunday afternoon talks, uh, this uh, rains retreat here at Amravati. So, the theme for today's talk is how to teach Paticca Samuppada to your dog, which is an unusual title for a Dhamma talk. <laughs> but, uh, we, uh, uh, the uh, period of time, the month or so before the, the rains retreat begins, I, I invite the nuns and the monks community to come up with suggestions. And we had 175 uh, titles suggested this year, and I chose 13 of them. So this one sort of jumped off the page, and I thought, that's interesting. <laughs> Particularly since uh, uh, my mother and father met because they were both dog breeders. So the, the world of dogs is close to, to my life. And so I thought, well, and also uh, Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination is a very uh, central theme in terms of, of Dhamma practice and, and uh, the Buddha's teaching. So I thought, let's, uh, let's explore that. I put my name by that one. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, some of you will know Paticca Samuppada, what it refers to. Others, that will be a bit more mysterious or, or uh, unusual, what that's referring to. So I'll just begin by speaking a, a little bit about that. Uh, so Paticca Samuppada uh, literally means something like uh, uh, the way things arise conditioned by each other. Uh, or conditioned co-production or dependent origination, how things come into being dependent upon each other, connected with each other. And uh, it's a, a very much a, a central part of the Buddha's teaching shortly after the Buddha's enlightenment, during the time he spent uh, in uh, Bodhgaya, uh, underneath the Bodhi tree and in the area of the enlightenment, uh, this was one of the, the things he was contemplating, was uh, looking at how uh, the the world works, and in particular, what what is talked about in terms of arising is how it is that we experience suffering or dukkha, uh, feelings of dissatisfaction, where that comes from, and then also how that comes to an end. And so, what we refer to as as um, dependent origination, it's, it uh, more accurately should be dependent origination and dependent cessation. That's the uh, the origination of dukkha is the the bad news, and then the, <laughs> the cessation of dukkha is the, the the good news. So they go together. What's called the the anuloma and the patiloma, the the the, the way that uh, dukkha comes together, and the way that dukkha suffering is brought to an end. And uh, uh, so, uh, in the descriptions of the time immediately after the Buddha's enlightenment, it, it talks about him sitting and reflecting on how this, this process works. And uh, it's described in a number of different ways, different places in the Pali Canon. There's about nine different configurations of the particular qualities, and, and uh, uh, certain emphases are given in different places. But classically, it's represented as having 12 different sections, 12, uh, 12 links in that, that causal chain of how dukkha, how suffering arises in our hearts, our minds, in our lives. Uh, and so that's the, the format that I'll refer to today. And, uh, uh, and uh, again, probably most of you are familiar with the teaching on the Four Noble Truths, um, which uh, again was the uh, crucial insight that the Buddha had uh, at uh, the time of his enlightenment. And what you have in dependent orig origination and dependent cessation, in a way it's describing the fine detail of, um, uh, of the origin of dukkha, so the no second noble truth, what is the cause of dukkha, how that comes into being, and, and, uh, say, uh, uh, and then results in, in dukkha. And then the so how uh, how the, um, the the feeling of dissatisfaction, discontent, incompleteness, how that forms, uh, 
Uh, that's the second noble truth. And then uh, the third noble truth is how that comes to an end, Dukkha Nirodha. So essentially the teachings on dependent origination, dependent cessation is talking about getting from noble truth number two, from the origin, the course, the, the source of Dukkha, to truth number three, the cessation, the, the ending of Dukkha. That's, that's the, the, in a way, the, the fine anatomy of those uh, aspects of the four noble truths. If, Hopefully that makes sense. And for, for those of you, this is your first contact with Buddhist teachings. I realize this is a lot of jargon and a lot of um, assumptions about what will be understandable. But I'm kind of presuming that most people who come and spend a Sunday afternoon in Amravati to listen to an hour-long Dhamma talk will have had some kind of connection or, or familiarity with Buddhist teachings before. So that the, uh, uh, the the teaching on dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada, is describing really how to get from from the, the cause of suffering, truth number two, to uh, truth number three, the, the cessation, the, the ending of suffering, that feeling the, the quality of liberation or peace, the, the realization of nibbana and uh, enlightenment. Uh, in the um, uh, in the teachings and in the classical understanding of dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada, uh, it's often ta it's talked about in different ways. And essentially, you can break it down to two particular formats. One whereby it's talked about as a momentary experience, how uh, the the attitude of the mind, the the, the habit or the, the direction the mind takes in the moment, uh, results in the experience of dukkha you know, in this moment. So it's called a, a momentary experience experience of, of uh, dukkha, the, uh, how it's caused and how it, it ripens uh, in the present moment, uh, here and now. And then the other mode is over a longer period of time, and it's what uh, they call the, the three lifetimes mode. And in various commentaries to the ancient scriptures, it talks about uh, the first part of the 12 links referring to a previous lifetime, and then another part referring to this lifetime, and then another part referring to a future lifetime. Um, and so that, that, that's a common understanding or a common interpretation. Uh, my own teachers, uh, Lumpo Cha, Lumpo Sumato, and uh, our other uh, uh, say representatives of the forest meditation tradition uh, of Thailand, they tended to emphasize the, the momentary approach or the momentary understanding. Both of those uh, are very clearly represented in the, in the Pali canon, in the, in the Buddhist teachings. You can, you can find both uh, uh, teachings on dependent origination, some that clearly refer to um, uh, a span of many lifetimes, and then, or several lifetimes, and others that clearly refer to a momentary experience. So both are represented. In the forest tradition, um, particularly uh, teachers like Ajahn Buddhadasa uh, and Ajahn Chah would emphasize that what they call the momentary approach, or how dukkha arises in this present moment and how it, but how it can also be brought to an end yeah, in this present moment, how we don't have to wait for some sort of future lifetime in order for things to be resolved. So uh, um, the, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, dependent origination then, to, to try and give you a, a a brief synopsis, I mean, you could spend a whole week just talking about <laughs> the nature of dependent origination. So uh, I did a book, uh, I printed a, a published a, a little book uh, on this very subject, not to blow my own trumpet, but um, uh, there should be copies around. This is called Catastrophe Apostrophe. The catastrophe ref referring to the arising of dukkha and the apostrophe uh, referring to the, the ending of dukkha. Catastrophe, apostrophe, the Buddha's teaching on dependent origination cessation. So a lot of what I refer to this afternoon you can find in this. And if you haven't got physical copies available here, then you can find it online in the, uh, on the Amravati website. But uh, in this, I, I, I describe how those 12 links can be uh, uh, easily sort of grouped into four distinct sections, particularly with respect to the momentary experience, the momentary arising of dissatisfaction. So the, 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 the first four, and again, I, I'm, I realize, realize I'm using quite a bit of technical language, but hopefully in the question period, there'll be time for clarification if needed. So the first four 
uh, of the 12 links, they're describing how the mind sets up the subject-object duality, me here, the world out there, or, or me, me, uh, what, me looking at my mind. So the, me knowing the world. So a sense of a subject and a sense of an object. So it starts off with ignorance, avijja, not seeing clearly. And then the, the next ones are uh, avijja pachaya sankara, uh, which means um, uh, volitional formations, or, uh, and that's the basic division into subject, object, and then that ripens into uh, consciousness and nama rupa. Um, again, there's a lot of detail could be given, but essentially those first four, it's how when the attention wanders, when there isn't perfect mindfulness, the mind very easily creates a sense of a me here and a world out there, a subject here and an object there, or a subject, and the, and the object can be my memories, my thoughts, my, my emotions, so it's a, but a subject and an object, and that gets formed and seems to be a, a substantial uh, division. There's a me here and a world there. That's the first four links. Then the next three is the establishment of the world of perception and feeling. So after um, Nama Rupa, mind and body, or mentality and materiality, you get the six senses, sense contact and feeling, Salayatana, Pasa and Vedana. So there being me here, the world out there, this body with, its, with eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and the, the body and the, and the thinking mind, then there is sense contact, seeing an object, hearing a sound, tasting a flavor, smelling a, a, an odor, odor, feeling sensation, and, uh, thinking a thought, uh, and then there's a feeling, pleasant, painful, or neutral, a sensation that arises based on that contact. So that's all fairly simple and straightforward, uh, how the, the, uh, per, the, the, the experience of perception, me, here, the world, there, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, how that gets set up. Then, <laughs> so then we get to the third section, which is the mind getting caught by uh, something that we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch, or think, uh, grabbing hold of that and getting lost in it. So this is the outflowing tendency of the mind. So that's craving, uh, craving, grasping, and becoming. Uh, tanha, upadana, bhava. Uh, that's the, the, the third section, the outflowing tendency of the mind. And then the last section is birth, uh, psychological birth, jati, and then the results of having been born, having a absorbed into that sound, that sight, having kind of taken hold of that, that feeling, that thought, that memory, that idea, uh, having grasped that impulse and getting lost in it, then the result of that is the uh, is dukkha, or dissatisfaction, the disappointment that that, that pleasant feeling couldn't m sustain itself as pleasant, or that painful feeling uh, has, uh, hasn't gone away completely and it's going to come back again. So um, uh, the result is uh, as uh, uh, many of you who've listened to Lumpur Sumato's Dhamma talks over the years, he would very easily say, this results in Sokapari Deva Dukkha Domanasu Payaso, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, uh, which is a phrase that we use in our chanting quite a lot, so it's very familiar to us. But for others of you, you might think, huh, what, what was that? Soka, huh? <laughs> Soka Parideva Dukkha Domanasa Upayasa, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, unhappiness, in short. So that those four sections, setting up the subject-object duality, uh, setting up the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, modes of perception and feeling, uh, the outflowing tendency of the mind, and then the being born into things, and then the psychological birth and psychological death that comes from that. Those, those are the four sections of this, of this process. Uh, so that's the patiloma, the arising. The, un, uh, the sorry, that's the anuloma, the arising. Patiloma is uh, what goes against that, uh, and loma is is hair, like the fur of an animal is a loma, or hair of the body is loma. Uh, so anuloma is with the grain of the hair. Patiloma is against the grain. So then. Uh, when there isn't a vijja, when there isn't ignorance, when there is vijja, when there's awareness, then uh, that whole process is not fed, isn't supported, and the mind doesn't get drawn into the subject-object duality, doesn't buy into the sensory world, doesn't get lost in uh, the impulses of liking and disliking, and doesn't, doesn't get born into things, and then dukkha is not created.
repeated. So that's the uh, a very brief version of the, the apostrophe, the, the patiloma, the, the going against the grain. And that's the, the good news or the good possibility is that dukkha can come to an end or the mind can be trained to not create the causes of dukkha in the first place. And hopefully during this afternoon, I'll be able to cover some of that and how that works. Pause for breath. <laughs> So that's dependent origination in 15 minutes. <laughs> I realize this is somewhat wishful thinking. And uh, uh, along with this, this little book, Catastrophe Apostrophe, another really good book on dependent origination is the book called Dependent Origination by Venerable Payuto, P-A-Y-U-T-T-O, Venerable Payuto, which you can find online for free, which is a very, very clear and brilliant exposition. Also, we have copies in the Amravati Library if people wish to, to search for it there. So, um, that's the... Uh, um, the, the, anyway, the, the brief description of dependent origination. So that can, that can sound very complicated, very abstruse, and like, wow, that's, whew, I can't, can't get my mind around that. You know, I'll, I'll wait for the tea break and then I'll make my exit. <laughs> or maybe not even wait for the tea break. <laughs> this is all a bit much. So it can sound very complicated and abstruse, but essentially we all know this process. I'm not reading anybody's mind, but we know that fall, that kind of getting lost in a, in a thought, getting lost in a mood, getting lost in something that we see or hear or smell or taste, something that we like, something that we dislike. We all know that, the, the fall, getting, getting drawn in. Um, and and I, I use the word fall um, for a couple of reasons. One. Um, when Ajahn Chah was describing this, he said, you know, dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada, it can sound, you know, really complicated and it can all be, and it happens really, really fast. He says, it's like, to, to describe dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada, in detail, he says, it's like falling out of a tree and counting the branches uh, on the way down. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it's happening too fast to be able to track every detail, but you know, thud, ow! When you hit the ground, you know, ow, that hurt. <laughs> so he would talk about it in that way. And we all know that, that uh, the thud as we hit the ground, we've got lost in that mood, we got carried away with that angry impulse, that jealous impulse, that uh, acquisitive impulse. We, we bought something we couldn't really afford. We said something that was really cruel. Uh, we, uh, we found ourselves getting, getting lost in, in a mood or a, an impulse. And the, the painful, we know the painful results. Again, I'm not reading anybody's mind. If you're thinking, how did he know? <laughs> It's statistics, not psychic power. It's just, that's how we all are. That's, I, I would suggest one of the reasons why we gather together on a Sunday afternoon in a Buddhist monastery is because we know that thud as, as the ground is, is hit, as, as the body meets the ground. Also, uh, the, I use the word the fall because I would suggest, and I'm, if there's any biblical scholars here, you can welcome to, to debate this, but I would say that the, the first chapter of Genesis describing the creation of the, the universe and the, the, the fall of uh, Adam and Eve, it describes a very, very similar process. It's how the world comes into being, uh, how uh, the, the human humanity is created, the realm of a feeling, Adam and Eve in, innocently wandering around in the garden, everything is fine. Then there's tanha, craving, the snake comes along and says, oh, look, it's a very interesting fruit on that tree. Why didn't you? So that represents tanha, or craving. And then they, they eat the, the apple of knowledge, and then dukkha, uh, cast, out of, uh, cast out of the Garden of Eden, the pleasant realm of simplicity of feeling, I would say, uh, to, uh, as it says in the Bible, to um, uh, you know, all the days of your life, you will, bring, you will work with the sweat of your brow and bring forth children in pain. So um, uh, Eve and Adam are cast out of the garden. Soka parideva dukkha domanasa upayasa. That's so again a very brief exposition on the theme, but I would say it's it's really uh, in, a, in a mythological language and using that kind of a format, it's describing that same kind of of a fall. Also, you know, like the um, also it was very interestingly explored in in uh, James Joyce's largely impenetrable book Finnegan's Wake. 
that the the uh, the fall of the of Tim Finnegan, the hod carrier, dropped off a ladder and and, and crashed to the ground, and then uh, they're having they think he's dead, and, he, and they're having the wake, Finnegan's wake, and then he uh, during the, the the party at the wake, some whiskey from somebody's glass lands upon the lips of the corpse, and he wakes up. <laughs> So that the uh, the wake uh, when Tim Tim Finnegan wakes up uh, after the fall is also that whole book is is a uh, is also talking about the, the the fall and and recovery from the fall and just as a little aside um, for those of you who are interested in James Joyce and Finnegan's Wake there's no apostrophe in the title of Finnegan's Wake it's Finnegan's as in human beings wake it's an encouragement to wake up Finnegan's Wake as well as being Tim Finnegan's, with an apostrophe, wake, as in the, the funeral ceremony. That is an aside, I appreciate. I'm, I realize I'm one of the few people that's actually read Finnegan's Wake from beginning to end, <laughs> so, but I, I like to include it uh, here and there along the way in these various Dhamma teachings. So, on to the realm of dogs. <laughs> How to teach this... Uh, this, uh, these principles to, uh, to your dog. And I, I'm also assuming that not, not everybody here owns a, a dog in the material world, probably a few of you do. Uh, so the, but the title of the afternoon's talk is How to Teach Paticca Samupada to Your Dog. So we're reflecting on this theme. Uh, a few days ago I thought, well, there's, 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 a, there's outer dogs, there's dogs with four legs and, and fur and uh, you know, the, the, uh, wander around and are closely associated with human families. And there's the inner dogs, there's the inner dogs. So not all of us might have a, a dog as a companion, uh, as a physical dog, but uh, I would say all of us have an inner dog, the, uh, that aspect of our, our mind, our, our uh, conditioning of our, of, of our being that is very animal-like and uh, based on the kind of uh, animal instincts that uh, you, could, you can compare to the way that, that dogs operate. The last couple of weeks during these talks, I've, I've mentioned uh, the reptile brain, uh, the, uh, the sort of aspects of, of our mind and how the mind works in terms of the, the most ancient parts of our, of our brain about survival, sexual desire, territory, competition, and those very basic instinctual forces. I would say that the mammalian mind, represented here by dogs, <laughs> The mammalian mind is one notch above the reptilian mind. And again, not to get too lost in neurophysiology, but uh, in terms of our, the way our, our minds work and the structure of our brains, uh, so the next layer out of the brain uh, uh, beyond the, the basic reptilian functions and instinctual functions, then there's a, a bit more refinement, a bit more sophistication in, uh, in the, what we can call the mammalian instincts of our mind uh, that we inherit as human beings. And so that one of the distinct things, I would say, between uh, that distinguishes mammals from reptiles, like snakes and, and um, dinosaurs and and such like is that uh, and uh, in the world of mammals like human beings or you know dogs horses um, uh, and uh, the uh, cats and, and uh, other uh, mammalian creatures is that uh, the sense of uh, the, well, the, the the mothering principle the the uh, mammalian literally means that the, the 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 mother produces milk and that the the, the, the mother nurtures the offspring and the family a, a group of mammals they stay together longer there's a much more of a pack instinct they, in the mammalian world we look after each other we care for each other one generation is more inclined to to relate uh, kindly and lovingly and with a closer association with with stronger bonds of affiliation one generation to the next I, I agree. It's it's not the strict division. You know, you you do have uh, like uh, chickens working in flocks, birds working in flocks, and you have uh, uh, e even the um, in the in terms of evolution, they talk about the good mother dinosaur. Some dinosaurs seem to have looked after their offspring quite well and with, with care. But generally speaking, the, the mammalian world. Of, um, uh, uh, the, of animals that are more refined and uh, the, um, uh, occupy that, that strata of evolution that uh, we have a greater sense of, of um, 
as a community uh, of relationship. Um, there's more refinement in that respect. And that, so therefore the mind is a bit more trainable. So teaching for teacher Samupada to your dog, where it might be difficult to, to train a, you know, a, 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 a snake or a frog or, or a crocodile, uh, uh, it's a bit easier to, to train a dog or a cat or a horse or, uh, or you know, the other members of the mammalian uh, uh, group. So talking about the, um, uh, the teaching Paticca Samuppada, teaching the dependent origination to the dog, it's like teaching that dog-like part of our mind that's still instinctual, that's still, you know, when we see something that we like, we, we want to chase after it. We see something that we don't like, we want, we, we want to snarl at it. Um, it's a bit more trainable, where there's, with the reptile brain, it's more reactive and there's less, uh, less um, space to maneuver. With the, the, the dog-like mind, <laughs> the, the, uh, that, uh, those, that instinctual impulse for territory, bon, uh, uh, what do, uh, belongs to us, uh, feelings of attraction, aversion, there's a bit more uh, cir circumspection is a good word, a, a capacity to look around things, to consider. And so that's why we have, you know, the, as human beings, we have you know, dogs and cats as our companions, as our pets. We have horses that we, we ride. Also, along with my parents meeting because they were dog breeders, I also grew up on a farm with, with horses. And um, so I grew up riding horses and, and ponies. And so you know, there's, a, there's a trainability and a sense of, of, a, of closeness. There's still, there's animal parts of our nature, uh, you know, attraction to, to what's desirable, aversion to that which is painful and, and undesirable. But it's workable, it's trainable. So that, to me, is where the... The how we can teach dependent origination to our dog, the inner dogs and the outer dogs as well. Um, another little interesting um, aside uh, with respect to, to um, uh, mama is the Pali word for mine is mama. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a, the, a word or, or sound made by babies around the world uh, in relationship to, to their mother and uh, the, the feeling of hunger and mama, mama, mama. So many languages around the world have that as a, the word for mother or is something like mama or ma uh, in, in uh, Hindi, Sanskrit, uh, in uh, many languages around the world. But in Pali, it means mine, etang mama, this is mine. So it, to me, it's interesting that the primordial owning is between the mother and the child, the child and the mother. The child owns the mother. You're my mother. You're my source of happiness and comfort and safety. And the mother has, as the Buddha said, uh, even as the mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings. So that, that image of the mother caring for the, for the her child is the, used by the, by the Buddha as an example of, uh, of that sense of, of close and uh, comprehensive bonding. So, uh, get to go to the theme, <laughs> how to teach the, uh, these pr uh, principles to our uh, dog-like mind, the inner dogs and the outer dogs. Well, uh, again, reflecting on dependent origination, um, uh, I, uh, uh, and also listening to the teachings of, of Lumpur Cha, Lumpur Sumato over the years, um, uh, I, th there's a, they would point out there's a number of exits, a number of places where it's possible for the mind to, to get off the wheel of birth and death, it, it, exit points from the cycle. That dependent origination is also called the bhava chakra, or the wheel of becoming. The bhava, bhava means becoming, chakra is a wheel, bhava chakra. So there's, uh, and you can, I, I would say you can distinguish uh, four clear exit points from the cycle of the bhava chakra. The first one is when dukkha has already uh, has arisen, so that it's where uh, you've already lost it. You lost your temper, you got upset with someone, you were filled with self-righteousness, or you, uh, uh, you bought something that you couldn't really afford and it was really attractive you know, in the shop or on the website, and oh my goodness, I can't believe I paid all that money. And uh, <coughs> dukkha, the, the, you're re there's a feeling of regret uh, and painfulness of um, the, the painful results of, 
of what you've done. You've, uh, you've upset that person that you shouted at, or you've got, to, uh, you've got to find the money to pay for that thing that you just bought, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So dukkha. So that's the exit point, is how the mind relates to dukkha. And it, again, in the, the Buddha's teaching on the, on the Four Noble Truths, he says it starts off by that, that same recognition, idang dukang, this is dukkha. <laughs> And uh, when he spells out the Four Noble Truths, he says, this dukkha, parinye yanti, it is to be apprehended, to be appreciated. Not saying, I'm suffering, or I don't want to be suffering, or I, sh I shouldn't be feeling suffering, or when's the suffering going to be over? But here is dukkha, idang dukkang, this is dukkha. And so um, that conscious appreciation of the painful results of having followed the uh, grasping and attachment and being born into something. So in terms of dog training, <laughs> many, many years ago, uh, there was a, a monk in this community who was from New Zealand. And uh, uh, there was a, a, a Dhamma reading from the, a particular sutta. It's number 20, uh, number 20 in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle Length Discourses. And it's called the, um, the, the quelling or the, the, the quietening of distractive thought, distracted thoughts, the Vitaka Santana Sutta. And in this sutta, sutta number 20, in the middle length discourses, the Buddha describes five different ways of helping the mind to quieten down, to, to still the mind's thinking. Um, and uh, so, uh, and in that, um, the, uh, uh, one of the, f I won't go into you know, all of the, the five methods he spells out, but the second one on the list uh, that the Buddha describes, they, they go from the most refined to the most coarse. The second one on the list is um, uh, to use the, ref the power of reflective wisdom and appreciation that uh, if I f keep following this train of thought, then it's going to lead to my uh, difficulty for me, difficulty for others. It's going to create more confusion, conflict, and, and discord. Uh, if this is followed, if this is believed, and this is, if this is hung on to, then it's going to be uh, painful and miserable. Uh, and he said, just as if a young person who's, f who's fond of their appearance, who likes uh, fine clothes and beautiful ornaments and jewelry, and they like looking at themselves in the mirror, you know, someone likes to admire themselves, just as if they had the, the dead body of an animal, a dog or a snake, or, or actually even says a person, uh, uh, hanging around their neck, they'll be, they'll be disgusted, they'll be upset, they'll be, they'll be put off by the presence of this rotting corpse around their, their neck. So in the same way that uh, looking at the, the, the results of where your thinking is going to take you, it's like, oh, well, why, would you want to, why would I want to hang on to that? Why would I want that round my neck? Why would I want to, to sustain those, those, uh, the, those trains of thought? And so the, the Buddha uses that, that image as a way of, of helping the mind to let go of, of uh, uh, say, um, uh, the busy uh, habits of, uh, of thinking and trains of, un of thought that are leading in unskillful directions. So anyway, this, uh, uh, this sutta was, was being discussed or was in the little sutta class that we were having. And this New Zealand monk um, said, uh, uh, you know, you might think that's a bit of, a, of an extreme example or that you might, one might wonder why the Buddha would say that, uh, you know, hanging a, the, the dead body of a snake or a dog around your neck. And you know, no one would ever do that. He said, actually, that's how we train sheepdogs in New Zealand. <laughs> quite surprising. He said, yeah, if, a, if a young sheepdog kills a lamb, this was the way he described it, if, it, if a, a young sheepdog kills a lamb, then the farmer, in order to train the dog, to, that, that, that's really absolutely not to be done. Your job as a sheepdog is to protect the, the lambs, protect the sheep and look after them. You know, if, they, if they kill a lamb, uh, what they do is they, they tie the, the body of the lamb the dead lamb around the neck of the sheepdog, so it can't get rid of it. So it it's, it stays there around its neck, and so that the the the, the smell of the of the, the rotting body and the kind of uh, the the burden of it, it's really nasty, and the dog really doesn't like it. So that the the message gets through, and so it was a very it's a very. I mean, he he told that story more than thirty years ago, but it still sticks in my mind. <laughs> all this time later. Uh, and so in a way that's, that's uh, consciously uh, acknowledging the painful results of having been born into something, having followed that impulse of, of desire or fear or uh, aversion or jealousy or selfishness. 
Okay, here's the painful result. So on a human level, dealing with our inner dogs, not, most of us are probably not training sheepdogs. <laughs> Don't need to, to use that in terms of looking after our farm. Uh, um, my, my guess is there's not that many sheep farmers here today, either present or past, but maybe. So on the, the, uh, on the psychological level, training the inner dogs, then uh, it's, this is to do with hiriotopa. Uh, and hiriotopa, the, uh, those of you who came in the main doors might have noticed on either side there's a kind of deva-like figure one with a red surround, one with a blue surround on either side of the main doors as you come in. Those represent Hiri and Otapa. So when this temple was built in the 1990s, uh, Lumpur Sumaita particularly asked this friend of the monastery, Pang Chinasai, who's a classical Thai artist, to paint these figures. Because he, uh, he thought, it's, it's not that common that Hiri and Otapa are represented in, in uh, so physical form or in hum humanized or deva-like form, but they are sometimes. Uh, he, but he felt, uh, Lumpo Sumedha felt this is uh, a, a very good symbol for us because Hiri and Otapa, they're called the Lokapala, the guardians of the world, they're the guardians of the heart. And Hiri and Otapa, they are our sense of conscience. So Hiri is that sense of like a moral sensitivity our conscience of when you've told a lie, that feeling of, oh, that wasn't really true, or if you've acted in a way that's you know, angry or selfish or, or greedy, that's, oh, that was, that was ugly. Um, that's a painful feeling. So Hiri is that conscience. Um, the, um, the, uh, again, uh, again, to quote James Joyce, <laughs> in, the, in Ulysses, there's a, a discussion between some of the characters of Ulysses about the again bite of inwit, which is an ancient uh, text written in Kentish, uh, ancient Kentish, about the, the, uh, the, the, the prick of conscience, the, the kind of the sharp sting of conscience, uh, inwit being the ancient word for conscience, the again bite, something that bites you again, <laughs> the again bite of inwit. So that is hiri, is that, that uh, again bite of inwit, the, the um, oh, that, was, that wasn't really true, oh dear, there's going to be a painful result, of, oh, what's that person going to think of me, I was so rude to them, I was so unkind to them, that was really, uh, wasn't really thoughtful. So, uh, when that's taken hold of with self-view, then it becomes guilt and turns into self-criticism. In itself, it's, it's, it's an extremely wholesome and skillful quality. Hiri and Otapa, they work by being painful. Just like physical pain works to protect our body by being uncomfortable, uh, Hiri and Otapa, uh, they work by being uncomfortable. They're, they are deliberately uncomfortable psychological states, because it's like physical pain. It says, that was off balance, that was out of, that was out of, keep, uh, out of accord. Notice that, pay attention, just like when we cut ourselves or we've broken the, uh, or we've twisted a, a joint, then you look after it, you tend it, you care for it, because it's, it, um, uh, it's been damaged so that the pain helps you to look after it, helps it to recover. So um, then Otapa is, it, there's different ways of interpreting it. One is the wise fear of consequences. Like if I, if I, if I do bend the truth, if I, if I tell a, a, a lie, or if I follow that, that, that greedy impulse, or that destructive impulse, this is, there's going to be painful results. So again, uh, that, uh, uh, that it's a painful mind state, but it's useful. So the wise fear of consequences. Another interpretation of Otapa is the painfulness of being uh, in the presence of unskillful action of others. So when you see someone being cruel to their child or being cruel to an animal or someone you know, hitting their dog or, or um, someone you know, you know, starting a, a fight or a war, you know, and that, that kind of painfulness in the heart, is, Otapa is also related to that, that painful, the presence of uh, unskillful action from outside. So that's the first exit point in terms of training the dog in de dependent origination, Patija Samupada, is that um, bringing attention to the painful results or the negative results of what they've done. So if, like the sheepdog, if it's killed a lamb, then tying a, 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 um, uh, uh, the dead lamb around its neck. I, I've never done that, even though I grew up on a farm. I never knew my mother or my father to do that. But certainly in training dogs, <laughs> 
I've been around a lot of puppies being trained, puppy training. Uh, if, the, if the puppy uh, pees in the house or, or on the carpet, or, uh, or house training uh, a puppy uh, or a dog, then the, uh, often that bringing the puppy to where the puddle is, and I actually, one friend I grew up with, there, they had a, uh, they had a collie dog, and it, its name was Puddles, on account of <laughs> how many puddles it produced in the house when it was a puppy. But uh, then bringing the puppy to the puddle and kind of bringing its nose right down to where the, the puddle is, and, and uh, making it, it get a, a full noseful of the results of having peed on the carpet, which uh, it can be done quite gently and firmly and without any kind of cruelty. That sense of you know you did this. This is not to be done. Okay. And then slowly but surely the, 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 the dog can be house trained and knows, okay, if he wants to pee or, or to excrete then, or to defecate, then okay, outside is the place to go. Inside the house, not good, go out. You know, so then the dog learns to ask to be let out. So second one, uh, second exit point is between feeling and craving, uh, between Vedana and Tanha. And, um, so this is, again, I would say where obedience training, in terms of training the dog, uh, in the, classically, in, in using dependent origination as a meditation teaching, as spiritual guidance, uh, the link in the chain between Vedana and Tanha, that's pointed out, that's the weakest link. And so it's one of the reasons why, when in the Four Noble Truths, when the Buddha defines the cause of dukkha, he says it's Tanha, it's craving. So if the mind can learn to notice feeling and not let the feeling cross over into craving, then that's the, the most uh, accessible exit point. That's the most useful uh, exit point. So uh, that is given the strongest emphasis in, in, in classical teachings, I would say. So that uh, um, in terms of, of, of dog training, <laughs> again, teaching it, then rewarding uh, good behavior. Uh, so that the, 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 the learning from dukkha is the, the, the kind of um, indicating the painful results of unskillful behavior. The, the second exit point is rewarding good behavior. So again, any of you who've trained uh, dogs, uh, cats are a little bit less trainable in my experience, but <laughs> training dogs, training horses and such like then uh, rewarding the, what we can call good behavior or desirable behavior. You know, like, sit, sit, stay. Good dog. Here's a treat. You know? I don't know how many hundreds of times <laughs> I've heard that over the years. Sit, sit. Some, some dogs are more trainable than others. <laughs> some of them just know treat. <laughs> and it's kind of a, I'm ready. <laughs> so now you have to sit first. You sit, sit. Sometimes the trainer has to be incredibly patient, but uh, it's workable. So that uh, that um, uh, learning to be obedient, to, to know that um, yes, there's the impulse to, to do something, but we can we can learn to overcome the impulse when the, when the, the the friend or the companion, the kind of owner, says sit, stay, heal. Yeah, um, that kind of. No, that, that way of, of rewarding the good behavior. Again, this is not a, uh, shouldn't be taken as definitive or the, or, or the only way of understanding this, but in, on reflecting on this theme, this is what came to mind. It's also interesting that the word obedience comes from the Latin ob audiens, which means to be completely listening, to, pay, to, be, paying com, to be paying complete attention. So part of that, um, uh, the, the learning to, to not cross the bridge between Vedana and Tanha, between feeling and craving, is to be paying attention, <laughs> to be uh, ob audiens, to be completely listening, to, to, to be attending carefully. And, um, and uh, in, in this respect, there's a... Um, uh, as uh, Lumpur Sumedha would often refer to, he said when he was uh, in, uh, in his early training in Thailand, he, uh, he realized that you could like things without wanting to, to own them. That you could appreciate, yeah, this is delicious food, but I don't need to have more of it. That person's a, 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 an attractive person, but I don't have to, to be close to them or to wish to, wish to be with them. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a beautiful uh, building, a beautiful painting. I don't have to own it. It's, it's a painting. It's, it's got a nice form. 
it is what it is. I don't have to own it. Similarly, we can dislike things without having to hate them or reject them. Yeah, that's, a, an, that's an ugly sound. That sound is unappealing. I don't have to hate it or resent it or, or fight against it. Or that person can be an unappealing person. I, I don't like that person's character or that they, they intimidate me or, or that they, there's something about their character that's off-putting. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to hate them or fear them or add anything on. You can dislike without hating. You can like without wanting. And so that was a powerful insight for, for Lumpur Sumedho as a, as a young monk. And in terms of this uh, second exit point, uh, the training of the inner dog, <laughs> uh, this is so useful, uh, so powerful. It, yes, oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so... You don't have to make anything of it. You know, that, well, that's awful. So you don't have to make anything of it. You don't have to, to reject or resent or fight against the unlikable. You don't have to chase after or absorb into the, the likable or have opinions about all the rest of it. You know, that, uh, so that gives us more space. The third exit point uh, is, uh, in reflecting on this, is actually kind of right at, I would say, right at the very beginning. Um, and again, Lumpo Sumedho's teachings uh, would emphasize this a lot, is that he would say things like, actually, there isn't really any dukkha. Dukkha is something that comes into being because we're not paying attention. But if we're paying attention, we realize that that dukkha isn't, there isn't anything really wrong or bad, it's just, it's uncomfortable, but the mind adds wrongness to it when it's not seeing things clearly. It is just the, the feeling of this moment, it's like this. So he often would say, there really isn't really any dukkha, <laughs> there isn't really any dukkha to come to an end. So, uh, in t uh, really this is relating to the, the patiloma, the, the cessation cycle, where if if there isn't any ignorance, if there is vijja rather than avijja, if there's awareness, that awakened awareness, then uh, we relate to the realm of perception and feeling quite differently. And again, in this little book, I, uh, I emphasize a particular sutta. It's in the Book of the Tens, in the Numerical Discourses, sutta number 58. Um, and it, uh, it, it describes that sort of causal chain uh, of perception and, and uh, you know, how the mind relates to perceptions, but it has a very, very different result. And so, uh, uh, essentially, if the mind is awake and aware, it says, rooted in interest are all things. So root, if there's chanda, if there's interest, then um, born of attention. So you can be interested in a sound or a, a sight or a flavor. Uh, born of attention, you, you bring attention to it. Yeah, arising from contact, yes, there's this, it's a sound, it's a, f a visual form, it's a, it's a feeling, it's an idea, it's, a, it's an emotion. That it's there. And it leads towards feeling. And that could be, yeah, there's a, a sound. It's beautiful. Or it's a, there's a, a form. It's, it's ugly. Or, or there's a, a, a memory. Oh, that's painful. Or there's a, uh, an emotion. Oh, that's delightful. So that Vedana, it's, it, it goes from, uh, say, from interest, attention, uh, contact, uh, and then to feeling. Vedana, uh, and then feeling, Vedana Samusarana. If there is wisdom, if there's awareness, then when it reaches the level of feeling, rather than that feeling conditioning uh, craving and then going off into the outflowing tendency and getting lost and producing that uh, rebirth, being born into things, instead, uh, in that particular sutta, it says, uh, uh, headed by concentration, uh, dominated by mindfulness, surmounted by wisdom. So samadhi, sati, and panya, concentration, mindfulness, and wisdom. So there's a feeling of like, yes! And then the mind knows, oh, here's the feeling of yes. <laughs> that, that yes just happened. Uh, this is the mind having a, a reaction. There's concentration of paying attention to what's there. There's mindfulness of knowing what it is. And then the wisdom, the, that discriminative wisdom that says, well, this, this yes is a mental event. It just arose and it has this quality. Um, it's a, it's an icha dukkha anatta. It's a, it's a, it's a, a pattern of, of experience, yeah, arising and passing away. It's not me or mine. It doesn't, it isn't a self. It doesn't belong to a self. Then the process continues. Uh, uh, in the, it's in the book of the tens because there's ten stages. So after, uh, uh, surmounted by wisdom. 
then it leads to yielding deliverance as their essence are all things, the vimuti, uh, merging in the deathless, in the uh, amata dhamma, merging in the deathless are all things, and then finally terminating in nibbana are all things. So that very process of, of perception and feeling, then rather than leading to, to, to dukkha and the, the, uh, to the, the continuation of the, the spinning of the wheel, the turning of the wheel of birth and death, instead the result is nibbana. And a very succinct way of summarizing those two, the analoma and the patiloma, the arising side and the cessation side, uh, again, Lumpo Sumato um, uh, summed it up very, very clearly. He said, if you start off with ignorance, you end up with dukkha. If you start off with, with awareness, you end up with nibbana. That's the short version of the whole thing. <laughs> so in terms of tr dog training, let's see, we're keeping my eye on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, so that third exit point is relating to alertness uh, and, uh, and awareness. And so and, uh, the, really good, the really kind of well-trained dogs, <laughs> like sheep dogs, <laughs> really good sheep dogs uh, and really good guard dogs, one of the main characteristics that they have, again, in my limited, even though I grew up in a, 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 dog, a doggish family, my father's great achievement in his life, he used to judge dog shows. He judged best in show at Crufts Dog Show in 1983. So that was the sort of arahantship for the dog, the dog, dog judging world is the kind of, no, you can't get any higher than that, uh, is to judge the best in show at Crufts. So my, that was the peak of my father's career, 1983. You can look it up, Tom Horner. It, it was a, uh, a red setter was the one he gave the best in show to that year. Anyway, that's an aside. <laughs> so the kind of most sort of well-trained or, the, or the, the kind of uh, the keenest uh, dogs, guard dogs and sheep dogs, they are really alert. Uh, they're conditioned to be really awake, really alert and really attentive. And so that um, uh, that, uh, I would say, is comparable to this, this third exit point is um, being awake, having vijja clearly and fully established, that awakeness and alertness, that's the third exit point, is not letting the, the, uh, the cycle begin in the first place. The fourth exit point, uh, when I was contemplating this, I was a few years ago, uh, I was, I, I'd used those first three quite often in, in various different talks and situations, and I noticed actually those three, they relate to the first, second, and third noble truths. First one is dukkha, the second one is about craving, third one is, is about dukkha niroda. Oh, I wonder if there's a, an exit point that's related to the, the fourth noble truth about the, the eightfold path. Uh, huh, I wonder. But I thought, well, we're already back to zero. We're already at, uh, at Vija, so before Avija. How can you get sort of back before zero? Then uh, I, I recollected that there was a particular teaching that the Buddha gave about the causes of ignorance. Predictably, it's called the Avija Sutta, the Ignorance Sutta, Discourse on Ignorance. And um, it's a little bit further on in the Book of the Tens. I think it's Sutta number 61, I think. I didn't check that one. I think it's Sutta number 61 in the Book of the Tens in the Numerical Discourses. It's called the, the Avijja Sutta, the Ignorance Sutta. And uh, he, he points out that the ignorance has a cause. And it's not very often in the teachings that the Buddha spells this out. There's only you know, one or two places he talks about what's the cause or the basis for ignorance. But in this particular teaching, uh, where it starts out is um, drawing close to good people is the cause for vijja, for awareness. Not drawing close to good people uh, is the cause, is the root cause for ignorance. Sapurisa sangseva. So sapurisa is a good person or a well-rounded person or a, you know, someone who's a, a spiritually mature person. So if you, draw, if you don't draw close to good people, then you don't create the, the conditions for listening to the good Dhamma, Sadhamma Savana. If you don't listen to, to good, helpful Dhamma teachings, then faith is not, uh, is not supported, faith erodes. Without faith, uh, then you, there's less of a quality of um, wise reflection. Without wise reflection, uh, then there's less uh, mindfulness and full awareness. With less mindfulness and full awareness, then you tend to be reactive 
rather than responsive. There's less restraint of the senses. If, the, if there's lack of restraint with the senses, then that tends to feed unskillfulness in, in body, speech, and mind. The, the lack of, uh, of restraint, the, the, the strengthening of unskillfulness in body, speech, and mind, that feeds the five hindrances, and the five hindrances are the immediate fuel for for avijja, for ignorance. That's what puts petrol in the tank of avijja, is the five hindrances, sense desire, ill will, uh, dullness, restlessness, and skeptical doubt. But if you do draw close to good people, then the opposite. Then, then you create the causes for listening to good teachings, that, that feeds faith, that feeds wise reflection, that feeds um, a greater quality of... Uh, of um, mindfulness and full awareness uh, that feeds the um, uh, the mind the, the ability to be restrained in the senses indriya sangvara if there's restraint in the in the senses then that conduces to to wholesomeness skillful actions of body speech and mind that then leads to feeds and supports the four foundations of mindfulness the four foundations of mindfulness feed and support the seven factors of enlightenment and they fo they feed and support full knowledge uh, of uh, and awareness of, of liberation Ta -da. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's the, uh, uh, the long way of saying the, the fourth exit point is good companionship. And uh, reflecting on this in terms of dog training, that sense of the bond, uh, and again, what, where I think mammals, um, and those of you who look after reptiles, have reptiles as your pets and your friends, think, you don't know my snake, Ajahn. My snake is a very mature spiritual being. You know, I've, I've been together with this boa constrictor for 15 years, and you know, she's a wonderful being, and you know, how dare you malign my beautiful snake. But that may be the case, but... With mostly by people call uh, call dogs, you know, uh, our best friend as human beings, uh, because those bonds can be incredibly strong and close. And that what feeds that dog training is the love and the connection, the closeness between the the animal and humans. The, the, I, I hes hesitate to say owner because I don't think we really own any anybody else or anything else. But uh, those bonds can be incredibly tight and uh, very, very close. And people are familiar with the stories of when a, a person dies, a dog going to the grave and sitting on the grave for, for weeks and weeks, months sometimes, refusing to leave the graveyard sometimes. Th those are not made up. Um, many of those stories are absolutely true. And I thought I just would finish with, with one little story about uh, my sister's dog. Uh, so my sister, she was a, <coughs> she's retired now, um, but she, um, she was a nanny uh, for a family down in the West Country, uh, and uh, they're four children and several you know, dogs and horses and such like. And one of the pre very precious, much beloved dogs was a, sh was a chihuahua. And one day the chihuahua went wandering and got into a relationship with a, another male dog up the road of un undetermined uh, breed. Uh, but the chihuahua became pregnant from this encounter. And this was a, it was a purebred chihuahua with a, you know, a pedigree. And uh, those of you who are into dog breeding, you know that if you have a pedigree dog, you don't let them breed with unpedigree animals. And you kind of very carefully look after ancestry and who was the mother, who was the father, and the, you keep records of, of the, 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 the dog family tree and so on. So the chihuahua becoming pregnant by some stranger from up the road was... It was not it was not looked upon a very uh, very positively, but uh, so anyway, <coughs> this Chihuahua, she became very very pregnant and then gave birth to one puppy and it was it, she nearly died in the process because the puppy was it was very very large compared to the mother, um, and the family were not uh, uh, maybe I know this is being filmed and recorded but uh, so I don't want to malign the family but the family didn't look very very fondly upon the offspring. Uh, the the that uh, the the uh, the chihuahua had, but my sister, as the the nanny, uh, then uh, she she um, drew close and made a particular point of looking after this this puppy of of mixed ancestry, and uh, and so the little dog was called Bumble, and so because my sister was Bumble's companion and the one who looked after him and cared for him, and Bumble became extremely devoted to my sister. And when she finished work as a, as a nanny with that family and went to work as a nurse for children at uh, Yeovil Hospital, then she asked if she could take Bumble with her. And the family said, yes, of course. Yes. 
So she and Bumble were a, were, a, were, a, were a pair for a long, long time. Bumble was so devoted to her, he wouldn't be left at home. So he would demand to, be, to go with her in the car. And he'd sit in the car and sit in the car park at the hospital all day long while she worked. And then, uh, and, and if, uh, even though the mother was a chihuahua, dad was something larger, but he was not a very big dog. <laughs> But uh, he would defend my sister with great ferocity. You know, any, any dog that came nearby, or even other uh, people came, came near to my sister, Bumble would, would snarl at them and bark and, and was, was uh, uh, incredibly courageous. You know, big dogs sometimes would, would come by and Bumble would kind of do his job defending my sister. And he, you know, he really took it seriously. And, uh, it was, and just to share with you this really, and why I share this story about companionship and bonding. So he was deeply devoted to my sister, wouldn't be parted from her. And so my sister was living together with her partner, a human partner, <laughs> her husband now. Um, but uh, they weren't engaged. They, they lived together as a couple. Uh, and all, during all that time, uh, my sister's husband, Tony, he hadn't grown up with animals, and so he was a little bit cautious around, around Bumble. And Bumble let Tony know, like, she's my responsibility, you know, you, you better behave and don't do anything you shouldn't be doing. And so Tony kind of had to be a bit careful, even though he was a lot bigger than Bumble. But um, <coughs> so... Uh, 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 but, so Bumble was definitely my sister's defender. When Tony proposed to my sister and they were engaged, then Bumble stepped down. Somehow he knew. And the whole way, it's like, okay, it's your responsibility now. It was, uh, you might think this is magical thinking. Or this is just, but it was really quite distinct. I knew, would visit from time to time. But it's like... It was really quite striking that he said, okay, I've done my job, now it's your turn, you look after her. And, um, and then, speaking of passing away, so then they got married, uh, or they were about to get married, and, my, and they had this plan for a honeymoon, and my sister was like, what are we going to do with Bumble when we go on the honeymoon? Whew, it's going to be difficult, because they went you know, off, off to the Caribbean for the honeymoon. How are we going to do that? Because Bumble won't be happy in the dog's home. This is not going to work. Oh, this is terrible. And Bumble had a few ailments, was getting quite old. He was sort of 12, 13 years old by this time. And so my sister was really quite anxious. Well, how are we going to do this? Maybe we have to change our plans for the honeymoon and just have the honeymoon in Dorset, you know. <laughs> anyway, I won't put too many thoughts and in, words into her mouth. What happened was that Bumble passed away about three weeks before the wedding. So it's just like, don't worry about me, I'm fine, bye-bye. Yeah, you're in good hands now, I'm, I'm off. So then uh, uh, Bumble was buried in the garden of the, where, they, where they lived, with a Guan Yin statue, <laughs> at the end, and surrounded by forget-me-nots, Bumble's grave. To, and so that was a, a um, uh, apologies for a few, a few tears are shed. But the, it's a sweet story, but it's, it's a true story. And that, so there was a, that kind of companionship, like that when we really cherish our, our bonds with each other, when there's that sapuri satsang seva, our companionship, it makes a difference. It means a lot. And so in terms of, of um, teaching dogs dependent origination and <laughs> reflecting on this, I'd say that that's one thing that we can learn is that that wordless, profound, uh, unconditioned uh, companionship, that, that f uh, friendship for each other, that's uh, a powerful and wonderful resource. So I offer these thoughts for consideration today. Thank you, Ajahn. I have a question uh, about uh, a point that you were making about uh, Lumpo Samedu had mentioned about um, it's okay to dislike but not to hate. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to love, but not, uh, I think, attachment. I think that's what you're referring to. So I just wanted to understand a little bit more about the disliking part. <laughs> Cause, uh, well, it's, um, it's teasing it apart, um, uh, liking and wanting, or, or disliking and, and not wanting. So often those are... They're, they're sort of mushed together, they, they, they run together, because they, they, like Vodajan Chah is saying, it's like falling out of a tree and trying to count the branches on the way down. 
that it goes from easy, we go so easily from I like to I want, I've got to have, to I dislike, I can't stand, I, you know, I've got to get away from, I've got to get rid of. Um, but uh, in, um, in a development of, of meditation then, and the strengthening mindfulness, then you begin to see that, oh, there is actually a sequence there. If you sort of slow it all down, like slowing down the descent, you know, take a film of it and just <laughs> slow the film down. Um, and so that it's just like if there's a, a, a taste that you, you know you you, ate, you you put something in your mouth, and the the taste is unpleasant, um, then it's a like you you're not trying to make yourself like what's unlikable. It's like the taste is oh that's that that's sour or that's weird. You know, what, what is that? Um, so it's not likable, but the mind doesn't have to add any hatred to it. And so the, it's, uh, it's that, in a way, uh, developing the skill of, of uh, being with the feeling and, um, and not letting that feeling turn into craving. So uh, in a way, the, it's the linchpin of the forest monastic life and, and our, our training um, it's, life is a bit more comfortable physically in the in the West than it is in the forest in, in Southeast Asia, but um, still, it can, it can plenty of challenges here, regardless. <laughs> but uh, the uh, so much of the, our traditional training revolves around mindfulness of feeling, and that um, you're you're living a, 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 in a way of life dealing with tiredness, dealing with hunger, uh, dealing with with discomfort. And uh, learning to to know that uncomfortable feeling, that hungry feeling, that that uh, uh, that uh, unlikable feeling, and just, and to not add anything to it. So it's like a focus of the training is that mindfulness of, of feeling and seeing how easily and how often the mind tries to cross that bridge to oh I really need to rest. How, you know how can I get away from this and go have a lie down. Or how can I find something to eat because I'm really hungry? You know, rah, I can't. You know, I can't wait. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And to to uh, get to to know those feelings and that oh, it's it's a hungry feeling. It's just that the the on one level the body is giving the message food is missing. Find food. But in itself, that hungry feeling it's just a, a sensation. It's just this is the experience of hunger. It's complete in and of itself. It's giving you the single, uh, giving you the signal. You're not complete. You need food <laughs> to be complete. But it's a lie, really. I mean, it was, it's a, it's a, a, a half truth because that feeling of being hungry. Like, oh, I'm hungry. If you notice uh, in that moment, uh, there's a hungry feeling. Five minutes later, it's not there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I didn't have anything to eat. And that hungry feeling has gone away. It might come back again in a moment, but right now it's gone. So it wasn't an absolute fact that I, I have to have food to be complete. It was just, that was the impression that came from buying into that feeling. Aha. So it takes a lot of patience. And it's a substantial part of our, our spiritual training is that learning to be with uncomfortable feelings. Like, and the Buddha's advice to... On the, on the training, on the discipline, to a, actually to a group of 1,250 arahants was kanti paramang tapo titika. Uh, patient endurance is the supreme practice, is the supreme austerity. And uh, that learning to be with, uh, at ease with what's uncomfortable, not because you're suppressing, not because it, it, you're just making yourself numb, but not training the mind not to be reactive to those uncomfortable feelings. Um, so, and the, uh, I think one of the reasons why it's the centerpiece of our training is because <laughs> this is where it really makes a difference. And that we, we create a lot of, of negative karma and strong habits trying to get away from feeling physical discomfort or emotional discomfort, feeling lonely, feeling bored, feeling sad. And that uh, I gave a talk a, um, a while ago about the importance of being bored, sad, and lonely. 
and how <laughs> it's really it's really useful to be able to be bored and not to try and get rid of it to be sad and not feel like there's something wrong or to be to feel lonely and uh, Okay, it's just, it's an emotional state. You don't have to find somebody to, to be with. You can know this is the, the experience of being lonely. That's what this is. And it, 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 uh, I don't know whether it's going to be very appealing as a title for a Dhamma talk, how to be bored, sad, and the importance of being bored, sad, and lonely. It's like, well, I don't think I'll read that one. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, I've, uh, it's, and there's more of that than the physical challenges of being too hot or too cold, of being, being eaten by mosquitoes or, uh, that we get in the forests in Southeast Asia. But uh, it, it, having that as the centerpiece of, of practice is, is so helpful. Because then there's a, first of all, it's just in moments here and there, like, oh my goodness, I am really hungry, but it is just a feeling. Wow. Or I'm really tired, I'm really sleepy, but it's just that, that which knows sleepiness isn't sleepy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that which knows anger isn't angry. Oh. And at, and at first, it's just like a, a fraction of a second here and there, but the more that we practice, the more it's like, Yes, <laughs> that, that's the case. And it becomes more, it gets affirmed over and over and over again, and it, that, uh, that quality gets strengthened. But ridiculous amounts of patience are necessary. So. Unreasonable amounts of patience uh, are necessary. So please, any more questions? Hi, um, thanks again for your talk. So, a uh, question I had. So, say for example, I've been coming here now for a few months and um, I'm finding it very interesting and just generally I find it a really good way to be. But say, for example, my friendship groups are nowhere near on this kind of path and they're still very in that, you know, kind of external world. And I'm only 30, so I know for some it might be a bit early on to be interested in this, but how do you deal with... I don't find myself resenting them, but I can find myself wanting to not spend time with them because mm -hmm. I feel like I'm on quite a different path to what they now are. Mm -hmm. um, but then equally, that can feed into, you know, feelings of isolation if you're... Say your family aren't really understanding why you're going to the monastery all of a sudden or you know, why you find it interesting. So how, and I, you know, there was a big emphasis on company, you know, in what, you know, what you were talking about earlier. So how do you manage that to kind of not see yourself as separate, but then equally find it, I find it very, very difficult to associate myself how I was with them, where mm -hmm. you know, weekends would be going out to eat or, you know, going for drinks and this and that, but that's not really interesting me at the moment. So how do you deal with that shift and change? A <laughs> uh, very good question. I think uh, ma many of us uh, have uh, met that. M my, uh, I, uh, I was 21 when I went into the monastery, but it was uh, a lot of that motivation was because I didn't want to be doing the same kind of things that the people that I grew up with, my kind of dear friends, are still. I didn't sort of reject them as friends, but I just was not interested in living that way and. and the, the things that were valuable and interesting, it was just more and more, it's like, not, not irritated by it, but just not, not drawn, not, 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 uh, um, not appealing. So uh, I, mean, I don't make people's decisions for them. Um, you, know, you have to make your own choices. But I would say finding ways that you can both, you know, kind of in a sense be uh, respecting your own outlook on things uh, and also not feeling like okay this isn't important to me therefore I should cut these people off or just you know never uh, never talk to them again it's like well no just uh, uh, if there's other things you want to be doing like I'm going to be going to the monastery on the weekend or I'm going to go on a retreat or um, yeah I'm, I'm happy to come out to dinner with you but uh, you know I'm not going to go to the party because it just this, this doesn't doesn't float my boat <laughs> or whatever whoever wants to express it just say just 
And just the more that you can just be quietly confident in your own perspective, and it's not like you've got a thing against what your friends are doing and where they're at. It's like that's their business. It's like, and I think the more that you can be sort of comfortable in your own attitude, and then that's going to communicate itself. Like people know oh, that she hasn't got anything against us, or that she's not sort of sneering at us, or kind of you shouldn't be partying, you know. <laughs> but rather just. Um, if, if that's there within you, that attitude in, in your heart is like, it's fine, if you want to do that, that's fine, it's totally your business, I'm, it's uh, entirely up to you, but just, it's not for me. And the, the more you can just be comfortable in that attitude, then, uh, then it, it'll work itself out over time, I would say. I mean, I can't speak for your friends or you know, yourself, but uh, uh, if we come from a, a sort of an idealistic place of I should, uh, I should be this way, I shouldn't be that way, and, and uh, I don't want to be this, and I shouldn't be that. All, all of that, the idealism just makes us trip over our own feet, and it kind of clutters things up. And so uh, idealism is, is helpful to put at the edges, and how just to keep the practicalities uh, at the center. And to, to uh, and also don't feel like you have to pretend to say, well, yeah, yeah, I used to like that, but it kind of it doesn't really appeal to me anymore. It's like, uh, so, you know, th things are changing a bit. And uh, again, if, if you're just sort of at ease with yourself and you're not coming from a judgmental or idealistic position, then it's easier for people around you to appreciate that and to respect that and to say, okay. And then, um, you know, and if people want to ask you, well, what is it you get out of this? Or, <laughs> you know, then you can say a bit about it, but... Yeah, I would be cautious about it. if you have any tendencies to say, Buddhism is incredible, it's amazing, you've got to go to this amazing place, these amazing, wonderful people. And, you know, if you get too, kind of, uh, <laughs> I speak from personal experience, you know, if you get a bit too kind of over enthusiastic, then people, Whoa. understandably, they kind of, yeah, thank you very much, you know, may you be happy, you know, you know I've got other things to be doing. Um, but uh, yeah, for, I think most of the people who live here at Amravati and, and many of the people who come to visit, we've had that same kind of dynamic. And it goes way back to the Buddhist time and before that family and friends say, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing this? This is weird. You didn't used to be this way. <laughs> so right, you, know, you find these stories in the scriptures come, that uh, going way back that uh, yeah, this is an ancient story. But uh, just letting those changes happen within within yourself and just working with them as they as they take shape. That's what I would recommend. Any other questions, thoughts? Oh, and in, in the in the uh, in the break, um, somebody had a question about how that fourth exit point of um, Sapuri Sasangseva, companionship, good companionship, how that relates to the fourth noble truth. And I was saying how, well, when I, when I make these parallels, usually three out of four are quite tight, and then the, the fourth is usually a fudge. So I, I, I work at about 75% hit rate. 100% <laughs> is bad taste, you know, so 80%, 75 or 80% 80 is it's perfect. So, so generally, when I'm, I sort of draw these things together, it seems just by, certain, by the way it shakes down, it's usually one of them is a bit of a fudge. But with respect to that, and having said that, um, the, the fourth noble truth is like, that's the eightfold path, and that's really the medicine that is necessary to bring about that spiritual healing, the kind of the healing of the spiritual malaise. And the Eightfold Path is about the choices that we make, the attitudes that we have, the things that we do, what we say, what are the work we do, uh, how, we work, how we train our mind, how we make decisions. Um, all of that is the, is the, the aspects of the, of the Eightfold Path. And so it's about how we live in the world, the, the decisions that we make, uh, and who we choose to be with, what work we choose to do, and how we choose to do it. So that um, seems to me to, to relate to that uh, seeking good companionship, you know, drawing close to good people, because it's about the choices that we make, who we choose to be with, what do, what do they do, what, what do we do together, what are, what are our value systems. And that, uh, so there's a, a, an overlap there. 
um, I would say that it's a, the Eightfold Path is about how we work with the conditions of our life, our, our mind, our speech, our actions, our livelihood, you know, and, uh, and the, um, uh, the moment-by-moment -moment decisions that are made with, with respect to that. So that uh, I would say that's how the, that fourth exit point relates to the fourth noble truth. It's about moment-by-moment -moment choosing who do I want to be with. <laughs> And, and that sapurisa sangseva, drawing close to good people, it's not just being in the same room, it's also you know, what, uh, um, what do you read? What, what, uh, uh, what, what do you watch on television? Or what websites do you, do you visit? You know, what, what do we put into our mind? What do we draw close to? What do we give value to? I would say that's all part of the sangseva, drawing close to. Because nowadays with the, with the media, you can draw close to people and, and uh, one, one retreat we did recently, there was people from 27 different countries in 14 time zones joining in the <laughs> this weekend retreat. So drawing close on the screen, on a, kind of a Zoom, a Zoom retreat together. We're close, but we're literally 14 time zones from Bainbridge Island off the northwest of America down to Brisbane in Australia. You know, so we're together. <laughs> so that... Um, uh, and that, what do we put our attention on to? You know, who do we listen to? What do we, what do we give value to? That's also part of, part of that. So, I thought it was, I think, so uh, that um, yeah, I say is uh, related to that. Um, as that the fourth exit point is creating the conditions uh, to feed uh, knowledge and liberation, <laughs> and to starve ignorance, to to not put fuel in the avicca petrol tank through the choices that we make moment by moment, day by day so any other questions, thoughts, reflections these sessions are for you so don't be shy yeah. yes, Mariana are you yeah can you switch on the microphone There's a slider on the side. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. That was very useful for me. And I still got the question about uh, how do you deal with unknown when it's necessary to know <laughs> something? <laughs> because obviously the, this bit of information or the bits of the puzzle requires actions. Thank you. Well... Fundamentally, the universe is not under our control. <laughs> and that even though there might be the thought, I have to know this. You can know there's the thought, I have to know this. <laughs> but whether it results in actually being able to know a piece of information, then it's, it's unpredictable. It's not, not a fixed thing. The... Um, uh, the being ready to work with uh, things as we find them. You, know, you do what you can to clarify how things are working, what's going on. But uh, to, know, to be aware that there's always going to be a certain amount that's unknown or mysterious or out of control or, or that you can't predict, that, that's in a way more helpful. So that the decisions that we make, we, we use as much information as we've got. We have you know, use as reliable resources as we can, and then we make a best guess. So that then, when we make a choice or set a direction, then okay, well, given what I know and what uh, I can figure out, this looks like a good direction. Let's try this and see where it goes. Rather than this is the right thing, you know, I've decided this is the right thing, and then that kind of being born into it because then that that's right there creating dukkha. But rather, this looks like a good direction. Hmm, I wonder what, uh, you know, there might be other things playing into this, but this looks like a good way forward. Let's try this and see where it goes. So it's a whole, it's a, in a sense, a way of making decisions and setting direction free of self-view and not making it into I've decided or I know this is, this is, this is, this is right, this is correct. One of the most helpful teachings of the Buddha is uh, about about knowledge, about concepts and knowledge, information. It's uh, 
the Pali is yena yena hi manyanti tatatanghoti anyatati. And it translates as whatever you conceive it to be, the truth is always other than that. So reality is not uh, representable in terms of concept or language. There's always going to be extra dimensions, extra aspects that we don't know about. And that, uh, and that the concept, it's like a concept or a word is like a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional reality. No matter how good your drawing of a bottle is, you can't put water into your drawing. Three-dimensional water will not go into a two-dimensional bottle. <laughs> So it's the, the Buddha is saying how yeah, concepts are useful, words are useful. I mean, you have the whole so eighty-four thousand you know, units of Dhamma teaching, and we are here today because the Buddha spoke and used words, and that's so they have incredible power and value. But he also knew that a words can only point towards the reality; they can't encompass it. So that simple sentence. Whatever you conceive it to be, the truth is always other than that. That's uh, very helpful to bear in mind. So then every decision that we make, rather than this is the right thing, or yeah, I know this is good, they, well, it looks like it's good. Well, this looks like it's, <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a, a good way to go. Let's try this and see what happens. Then there's a whole different tone. The, the mind holds it in a different way. And then if there's a, a pleasant result, rather than, yes, I succeeded, I've got it right, and the, the ego claiming the good result, and then getting carried away with that, I succeeded, I got it right. You know. uh, instead, uh, if we say, well, okay, that's, that's had a pleasant result, what can we learn from that? What does it say about a good direction from here? So rather than getting drunk on the good result that comes, you, just, you, you treat that with the same kind of circumspection. And if it's a painful result, like something that you, you've chosen goes really pear-shaped, it's like, well, that was a total disaster. <laughs> it's exactly what I didn't want to happen. Right. So rather than I failed, what will they think of me? I'm an idiot. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, this is a total disaster. They, they hate, everyone hates me and making, again, an ego trip out of getting things wrong. Like, okay, well that didn't work, so what can we learn from that? And so then, you're not pretending that it really did work or that you're happy about it. It's like, well, that was a failure. <laughs> it was an expensive and painful mess. Okay, what can we learn from that? So then, you're, uh, the whole way that the mind relates to success and failure and decision making is very, very different. If you can, yeah. I didn't give uh, some background to my question. Is more of a practical. Um, if you have a thirty seconds for acting, because I do uh, try to attend a pilot <laughs> license, so you don't have that time to let's see th theory and. Um, yeah, that's what I suppose. Um, you're, you're, you're applying for your pilot's license. Yes, and you've got 30 seconds to, to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's not useful to say to yourself, well, let's, let's see and try this way. <laughs> <laughs> that's what uh, came to mind to ask you, how do you deal with the wisdom uh, following the path that you already talked about? The panya and the. Well, I, I'm I'm not applying for a pilot's license myself, so I can't <laughs> I can't speak from direct experience, but you know I I do step into situations where you know you've you've got to um, say respond to live uh, activities and and uh, like uh, you know so asking any questions you know <laughs> so that. Uh, the um, I was I would say it's similar to what um, what I was saying earlier. You know, okay, you've got thirty seconds to come up with a response. If you're in a flight simulator, then it's a bit better than if you're up in the air. If you're on the ground in a, in a in a simulator, then no one's going to crash and burn. So. 
but um, so it's a little bit more, uh, uh, say, workable or <laughs> uh, easy, uh, more acceptable to make mistakes. But uh, yeah, if uh, if you're in a in a situation like that, and you think, okay, well, and you and, but you you are actually up in a plane, then okay, you know your life and other people's lives depend on this. Uh, you either say, okay, well, this looks like the best choice, I, I'll do this. Or you say to the instructor, I'm lost, you take control because I've forgotten what's on page 16 and I know uh, uh, what I was supposed to do and it's gone. So please act now and hope that your instructor is wide awake, <laughs> ready to take control. But. Uh, yeah, that that that's uh, the kind of thing I would suggest. And if you're alone in the plane by yourself, then good luck. Remember, okay, just relax, breathe out. Page sixteen. <laughs> Don't think. Use the force. You know. <laughs> relax, breathe out. Oh, right. <laughs> Design, uh, the design of the planes are fa fairly safe. Yeah, relax is a good policy <laughs> for, for the design of the planes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got time for one more if there is any. If you can use the microphone, please. Basically, I'm new to Buddhism and um, I've read, I'm currently reading the Four Noble Truths, I've read like the Dharmapada, um, I've read of, like one or two e-books and um, some of the Buddha's discourses and stuff. I'm looking for like basically the next stage after the Four Noble Truths, like what book would you recommend or scripture? I've read somewhere about, um, is it the Peter Canon or something? Something similar like the Four Noble Truths that I could actually read after the Four Noble Truths that would take like, my understanding of Buddhism to the next stage kind of thing. Uh, well, uh, one of the, uh, the, the books I like to recommend, we just did a, 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 a printed a new edition of it, is uh, Ajahn Sumato's Mindfulness, The Path to the Deathless. So we just got a delivery of that last week, and so there's copies here. If you're, are you staying here at Amravati? I am, yeah. yeah. So there's copies of that around and done. I think I'm actually reading that. Is that basically <laughs> meditation techniques and stuff? Yeah, it's got different talk, talks on meditation. It's got a pair of the footprints on the front cover. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually reading that. Yeah, so what keep, about keep reading. The Suttas or the Canons, would you recommend that I uh, read through the Canons or the Suttas or something? Um, well, the, the Pali Canon... Um, as sort of, sort of starting at page one and beginning is a is a, uh, a bit of a challenging read. One of the very very good collections. That there's two books by by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Yeah. Um, there's a very small one called the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah. And that's really great. I, I did a, uh, a a study group in, in when I was living in the States. We did a study group for about three or four years, just going little bit by little bit, and it, it's really excellent. Uh, so it's just called The Noble Eightfold Path. That's quite yeah. a small book. And then if you're interested in the Sutta teachings yeah. in a more sort of complete way, there's, a, um, uh, there's a, a, an anthology of the Buddha's teaching that's arranged by subject right. by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And it's, I think it's called In the Buddha's Words. Right. And it's got a dark blue cover. I'm pretty sure we've got copies in the library here. But that, that's, it's, it's all Sutta teachings. Bhikkhu Bodhi's translations, but it's arranged by subject matter, so you can also look in the contents and see what looks interesting and go through it. So it's all sutta quotations, but put into an order that is much more kind of accessible and, and a, a systematic. So basically, Buddhist beliefs outline kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, okay. So so sorry. What's that called? Um, in the in the Buddha's words. In the Buddha's words. I think. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. But yeah, the author is Bhikkhu Bodhi. Okay. Bhikkhu Bodhi. Thank you. Okay, I think we can draw it to a close there. So thank you for your good attention and I wish you all the best in your dog training. <laughs> <laughs>